Oh, hi. Thank you very much. Um, and congratulations on everyone being here on a Sunday. I know it's a bit raining here in Sydney, so um, but, but it's really important that everyone engage. And if there's one thing we've learned this year with Zoom is we can bring so many people together from all around the country, which is really interesting. It's a great uh, opportunity, but it's really important and powerful. Um, first of all, could I echo my, the sentiments of paying my respects to traditional owners, uh, past, present and emerging, and, and I wish to recognise uh, their sorrow um, in the price that was paid uh, for where we are now. But with the hope that as we all learn from uh, one another, that we actually take better care um, of our land together. Um, it, it, look, where is climate? <laughs> um, I guess it's no secret that it was one of the, my driving motivators of my career change and my uh, getting into politics. Uh, at the 2019 election, it was a strong sentiment in Moringa that we wanted to be uh, represented and I wanted to offer an opportunity to the electorate to be represented by a local voice, but a voice that was really focused on the issues that mattered here. Uh, Warringa is traditionally an electorate, I would say fiscally conservative, but socially progressive in wanting action on those big things that we know are major risks for our future. And climate and sustainability and the environment is number one. Every survey I have done in the electorate has come back saying number one concern is uh, climate the, um, the, the and the environment. So obviously once uh, after the election, that was a really big focus for me was how do I try and come through the middle. We know climate politics in Australia has been very divisive and my, you know, my predecessor was a key um, player in the divisiveness of, of climate. We, we, we have to acknowledge that. Um, the, but we need to move on from that. 2020 needs to be the year where we've actually, we need to grow up and deal with climate. This is a risk that we know is now it's not some um, abstract risk that is that we might deal with in the future. It's very clear from what the events of 2020 that these are risks that are occurring now. Uh, if we look at the Bushfire Royal Commission report, it highlights that the uh, severity and, and the you know the how horrific the bushfire season was, that we need to prepare for events like that occurring more and more frequently um, and, and that we are going to have more and more severe weather events. And this is happening now. This is not some abstract for the future. What we can also see is that the, the world is moving on. So we, the Paris Agreement required many countries' signatories to make uh, commitments, but the, we have to be very clear about what the key component of the Paris Agreement was. The Paris Agreement was the international community coming together to agree that we stay, they should put their combined efforts to keeping global warming below two degrees and as close to 1.5 degrees as possible. And so every other commitment that comes under the banner of the Paris Agreement has to be done first and foremost towards that goal. So yes, the government at the time made certain commitments when it came to reducing emissions, but we need to be very clear that it is always towards that temperature goal. And we have the IPCC regularly updating how international commitments are going and the fact that, unfortunately, global warming is happening at a higher rate. Our emissions are climbing internationally faster. And so countries need to review their approach. They need to come back to the table with uh, adjusted uh, commitments. Uh, and under the Paris Agreement, in fact, internationally, all countries are due to come back every five years and come back with a renewed commitment. Now, that was due to be this year, 2020, in November, actually. Uh, in the next week, we were supposed to be in Glasgow for COP26, where all countries would come with a renewed commitment and an increased commitment. Now, unfortunately, as a result of COVID, that's all been delayed by one year. But that, that requirement to have an updated commitment hasn't changed. So that is still there. So for me, I guess coming through, I would position myself as a sensible middle centre politician. Um, for me, I'm, I don't see climate is not an issue of left or right. This should not be a question of what side of politics do you uh, 
prefer um, of whether or not this is an issue should be for you. This is an issue for everyone. The same way as we don't debate having uh, a defence force, we should not be debating having a, a position on climate policy and emission reduction. So I see it as absolutely vital that we take the politics out of this and the party politics um, and we actually come together with a consensus approach. Um, as a new MP, I looked around the world and I looked at, okay, well, where are the countries? How have other people done it better than us? How has Australia gotten to this position where we are at the forefront of um, feeling the effects of climate change? Um, and, and I guess as an aside, I would say uh, at the Senate um, hearings, Senate estimates just um, a week ago, the Bureau of Meteorology gave their evidence as to we are on track for about 3.4 worldwide degrees of warming, but Australia is on track for 4.4, so an additional degree because of where we are in the world. So we are at the forefront and we will bear the brunt of impacts as we saw last summer. So it's clear that um, the irony of Australia being highly exposed in terms of risk, uh, and I would say we're exposed from an economic point of view as a result of being heavily reliant on fossil fuels in, in our economy. Um, we, uh, we are heavily exposed from an environmental point of view. Many areas of Australia will be highly exposed to climate risks. Uh, and I think socially and health wise, uh, I've certainly had amazing conversations um, with people from the health sector, from insurers, um, who all talk about whole areas of Australia will be really difficult to live in, uh, will be uninsurable as a result of increased risk. So we absolutely have a need to, for our own, I think, economic safety, prosperity, um, health, environment, no matter what your reason for coming to the debate on climate is, there is room for everyone to want action. And I think that's where, for example, the Climate of the Nation report that Matt Keane um, announced uh, a few days ago from the Australian Institute shows 80% of the Australian people want action. So it really is time to take the party politics out of this and move forward with a, a plan. So I looked at what countries have done that successfully. And um, whilst in Australia back in, so 2005 to 2008 was where many countries got moving on climate legislation or action. Uh, unfortunately, Australia went down a path that was a very um, uh, was, was prescriptive in terms of a mechanism which was effective in lowering emissions, but was dismantled politically. Uh, it, it was weaponized. In the UK, what they chose to do is they introduced the Climate Change Act, which set their long-term goal of what they wanted to get to. And originally they set a goal of 80% by 2050 emission reductions. And now they've updated that to net zero by 2050. And then what that act, and that act had bipartisan support. It was introduced to their parliament as a private member's bill. It had bipartisan support from uh, both sides of politics and passed. And what it did, it was then in, in effect for the last, it's been in effect for 12 years. Uh, it survived Brexit and numerous uh, UK prime ministers coming and going. So, it, and it, it has bipartisan support. And what it does, because, and we hear this a lot in Australia of, you know, we're starting to see that that political game playing around, well, what does net zero by 2050 mean? What's your 2030 target? You know, I know the coalition have said of Labor's commitment to net zero by 2050. Well, you know, if it's so urgent, why are you setting such a long-term goal? Let's be really clear what net zero by 2050 does. And the great thing is the UK model shows it works. What it does is it sets into law our long-term commitment. It creates certainty for the private sector so that they know they can make long-term investments into infrastructure and into uh, technology, that they know they have a good 20-year return on that investment. Think things like car manufacturing. So in the UK, they have an electric vehicle car manufacturing in the Nissan Leaf as a result of having the Climate Change uh, Act and the net zero by 2050 in law, because they know that creates market stability. So 
What legislating net zero by 2050 will do is it will focus investment. The private sector, superannuation, um, there, there's a global race on for attracting the investment money. And by committing legally to that goal, we will um, focus investment in low emission technologies, which means we will develop more low emission technologies. You accelerate the pace of development and implementation. And as that accelerates, we can get more and more ambitious on our emission reduction. Because how do you get to a long-term goal? Now, net zero by 2050 is some 30 years away. But what the climate change bill that I'll be introducing to Parliament does, and it is copied on the UK bill, they have the same mechanism, five-year emission reduction budgets. Now, those budgets can start um, maybe conservative, but they can then increase and get more and more ambitious as technology comes online and you are able to sensibly, economically do that transition. Uh, a big part of the climate change bill that I'm introducing, once it sets that net zero by 2050 goal and the five-year emission reduction budgets, is it sets guiding principles by which you've got to achieve those goals. So you need to look at um, generational equity. We know that early action on emission reductions will cost a lot less than leaving it to the end. So we know that if we gradually and implement strategies early, it will cost less. So that is generational equity. We're not leaving it all for our kids to bear and pay for down the line. Uh, we need regional equity. You can't require one area of the country to bear the brunt of change versus others. So we need to make sure as we transition and we set budgets for areas to lower emissions, that everyone is doing their bit, that everyone is taken along and that there are plans in place. Um, we need to make sure there is fair transition. So sectors that are going to be impacted and we know they're going to be impacted. So mining communities, communities that are heavily reliant on fossil fuels, we know they need a plan, but it's not a service to those communities to have an MP with their head in the sand saying, just build another coal-fired power station or oppose action on climate because all they're doing to their community is they're stopping their community from being ready for the change that is coming. Um, and that is an absolute disservice that I, I don't understand. Um, I, I think it's really uh, negligent on the part of those MPs to not be making sure there is a transition plan for their electorates. Then we know environmentally huge challenges that need to be taken into account in the planning, just as uh, food security, food and water security, really important, regional development, um, all those aspects. So they are in the key principle, the guiding principles of the bill to ensure that the planning and the emission reduction budgets are done in a way that addresses that. Now, clearly, that what came out of the Royal Commission was um, Australia is highly exposed. This is a real risk to our communities. I think we all were shocked when we saw people evacuating on beaches over summer. Um, I think that, you know, they were our climate ref first climate refugees. So we need proper risk assessment and we need adaptation plans because like it or not, we've already reached certain levels of warming that are going to have an impact for the years to come um, and we need to be better prepared. We can't have a situation where reports are given to the government and they sit on them for two years without implementing the recommendations because they don't like the fact that it talks about climate change. So a key element of the climate change bill is risk assessment and adaptation planning that has to be done regularly. It has to be reported on publicly and to the parliament and the minister and the government have to respond and uh, notify of what the plans are. So this is a really important part for communities to know that their safety and security is front of mind and being addressed. Uh, I, I don't, again, don't understand how communities devastated by bushfires could accept uh, MPs, if they're part of the coalition, that are continuing with the party line of doing the speaking points, but not getting really up and angry about keeping those communities safe and making sure they are better prepared. Um, the fourth element uh, of the climate change bill is, uh, uh, is uh, we need an independent commission. We need independent expert advice. I think if we've all learned something from 
coronavirus, it has been that important decisions can be made and policies can be done when they're supported by science and they're supported by fact, we, we accept them. Uh, they are properly explained, they're properly justified. So it is really important that as we plan our path forward to net zero by 2050, we have a strong independent climate change commission with all the skills around the table uh, to make sure we have the right assessment and advice happening. Uh, at the moment, the government's approach is just the technology roadmap. Now that is one part of the puzzle and I've incorporated that into the climate change bill. Uh, the climate change bill takes obviously as we set five-year emission reduction budgets, you need to have technology readiness assessment. So what technology is ready to come online to deliver the results we need it to in each sector? Um, so I've incorporated the government's technology roadmap as one of those parts of the puzzle. It is one of the pillars that will get us to net zero by 2050. But no one single pillar will get us there without the whole framework. And that's the part the government is still um, dragging its heels on. Um, we've seen this week a number of our trading partners come out and accept that net zero by 2050 is where we need to go. Um, make no mistake, there's a race on. The rest of the world is heading to net zero by 2050. It will attract huge amounts of investment. And if Australia keeps the handbrake on the way we have at the moment, we will miss out. And that will be incredibly, uh, that will be an incredible negligence on the part of, of the government. So the solution, um, obviously groups like CCL are incredibly important because at the end of the day, change has to come with every single voter, every single person has to be motivated and convinced that there's a way of addressing this. Um, there's no point in people feeling panic that this is so big, so hard, insurmountable. How can we change this? I think we also have to be realistic. Um, there's there's place for every kind of activism in society, you know, <laughs> within the law. But we also need to bring everyone on board. Uh, we need to get everyone walking before we can all be running towards our goal. And so it's really important for you to reach out within your communities, get people on board, have the conversations, talk about the elements of what are the things people fear, what are the things they accept, what are the things they question? Because the more we talk about it, the more we will find consensus. I've got great hope that we've all got more in common than what we have apart. And it's with those things we have in common that we can build a policy that will be in the best interest of Australia. Um, so I've met with a lot of coalition MPs and backbenchers and Labor, the Greens and the crossbench around the climate change bill. Um, ironically, I've also met with a number of, uh, I've met uh, the Friends of Climate Change uh, Action the, the parliamentary friends. We met with um, the UK High Commissioner just after uh, Prime Minister Morrison had had his chat with Prime Minister Johnson. Um, uh, I've met with the Swiss ambassador. I've met with uh, New Zealand uh, First Secretary. I was in India this time last year. And all of, at each of those meetings, top of mind is, but what's Australia doing on climate change? What's Australia's emission reduction goals? So, it is wrong to think that we are just, you know, a player that the, uh, the rest of the world is not looking at. The world saw our bushfires last summer and wants to see us take action. We have a responsibility to, to and an opportunity to lead. Um, so I'm trying to find a way through the political bipartisan, you know, partisanship. Uh, on Monday, the 9th of November, so Monday week, I'll be tabling the climate change bill in Parliament. Uh, I was due to do it back in March, but had to delay it. Um, and the call is for all communities to really pressure their MP, whether you have a Labor MP or a coalition MP, or hopefully an independent, um, uh, to pressure your MPs to engage with the bill. It's not good enough to hide behind party lines. Uh, obviously, the way that Parliament's set up at the moment, uh, coalition has a majority of two in the lower house, so I'd either need two people to cross the floor or what I would really like is for the government to actually acknowledge that this is an area of policy that needs 
bipartisanship. This is an area of policy where it is time to stop playing political game, stop using people's future to try and wedge the other side and actually put in place a plan to keep all of Australia safe in the future. Um, if the Prime Minister doesn't feel that he can do that from a policy point of view within his coalition, if he doesn't have that leadership within his party room, then he should open it up to a free vote. It should be a conscience vote for more MPs. And that is something you can all ask of your MP, that it's not good enough to hide behind party lines, that you want them to push for a free vote so that they can show their colours on the floor of Parliament. Uh, it has to stop this era of saying all the right things about climate change action and my criticism here will be to a lot of moderate liberals um, who are in the coalition. They are in electorates that want them to take action on climate change and have better energy policy. And they say all the right things at election time. But at the end of the day, they are allowing the government, they give the government the numbers. So any two MP from the coalition, liberals or nationals, are giving the majority to uh, the prime minister to pass the legislations or to not pass legislation like the climate change bill. And so they all have to be held responsible. You are either going to step up and do something or you're as bad as a climate denier. Uh, and so I'm quite critical of that because I think it really is time that we all draw the line and everyone has to be held accountable for that. So it's, it's great to hear that CCL is planning on having an active group in every electorate because I think that's what's needed. You absolutely need to get people everywhere speaking up and asking for more, asking for better representation. Um, I know there's probably a whole bunch of questions, so I'm happy to hear. Um, uh, but that's the overview. The climate bill will be coming to Parliament on the 9th. There is a process by which it then um, has to go through. It won't be up for a vote straight away, but I will be pressuring the Prime Minister that this is a debate that we cannot put off. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our CCL channel by hitting the button in the top left hand corner of this screen. Spread the word of CCL by using the share icon to as many of your contacts as possible. Thank you. See you next video.